and we're streaming to YouTube and and to uh, Zoom as well. So welcome everyone. Um, I'm Dimitri, and with me today is Gautam Bakshi, who is uh, like a power Infranodus user and a great individual, and he's very interested in graph science and networks, and he works uh, as a consultant and strategist and researcher, and uh, he will demonstrate today his workflow that he uses with Infranodus, which I find really amazing. Uh, he is very fluent with the tool, so I asked him to you know, show how he uses it because I thought it would be really interesting for other people who use Infernotus. Uh, that will happen at the beginning of the webinar. And then uh, we will have a Q&A section where you can ask Atam some questions uh, using the chat feature or the Q&A in the Zoom. <clears throat> and then uh, from then on, I'll make a presentation of some AI exploration features, uh, some of the workflows that I found also to be useful in the last weeks and months of working on Infranodus. And as usual, feel free to ask any questions, to leave any comments. Uh, we're trying to make it as interactive as possible. Um, this webinar is also streamed to our YouTube channel, Nodus Labs, so you can watch it later. You can also watch it on YouTube as well. And uh, it will be recorded as well. So uh, if you later need access to it, to see some of the amazing stuff that Kotam will be showing, in slow motion, then feel free to do that. We will just wait a little bit more to see uh, who else joins in because usually it takes a couple of minutes for people to come in. Maybe Gotan wants to make an introduction about himself in the meanwhile. Sure, sure. Um, th th thank you so much for the introduction, Dimitri. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm a huge fan of Infernotis, of graphs. And um, when I found out what Infernotis was doing and, and Dimitri's work, um, I was hooked. Um, I am. I probably use this software more than any other software. It's it's, it's super helpful for me, and it, it saves me a ton of time. So I'm very grateful for your work, Dimitri, and um, I'm hoping um, I could share some insights that help your users. Um, but I definitely do not know all of it or a lot of it. I I I know. I feel like I just know a part of it. That, that that's super helpful to me, and I feel like every week I, I notice something new that I didn't think of. So. I love that the product keeps expanding and it's 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 really good. So I, I'm evolving as the product evolves, so it's good. <laughs> yeah, you. and the product is evolving also as you're giving your amazing feedback because some of the ideas or feature requests that you had while using Infernotus, I think you saw we integrated it very quickly because uh, we also thought it was really interesting. So that I also want to invite other people who use Infernotus if you are missing something in the tool, write to us and uh, you know share your workflow. And if you also want to participate in one of the webinars, later feel free to do that and i just wanted to say once again that i really appreciate gotham's time that he decided to share his workflow when he showed it to me i thought it was really useful so i'm really excited about that um, feel free to ask any questions um, if you have during his presentation uh, using chat or q a uh, you can also use youtube as well and uh, jean charles is asking if we can send the uh, some some documents related to the workflow um i think what we will do after is uh, just make some kind of bullet point list of the actions that that gotham takes uh, so we will make it available on our support portal sure yeah and mm -hmm. i feel like to be honest i use it for really cool purposes but everything i do is is i think fairly standard in this software so i'll show you guys how it works and if you need documentation on it, it's totally I can do that but it's it's mainly the main buttons that are available to me um so I, and that that's the other cool thing about this 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 tool is that um although behind the system there's this like powerful graph um it's actually very easy to use it's it's very at least for me I find it very intuitive if you I think if you have some knowledge of how graphs and network analysis works it's it, it saves you a lot of time and it's, it's fairly easy um but there are some features that Dimitri and the team have put together that um make a lot of the manual work around getting data and stuff a lot a lot much much easier not i'll go through those that's great so maybe we can begin already okay. um if you don't mind sure sure of, of course mm -hmm. so um i do a lot of presentations but i've never done actually no i've done some on graph theory but i think the last time i did it was 
at a graph theory conference in my city in Toronto, um, probably almost like 12, 15 years ago. So I'm a little rusty on, on this. So um, feel free to ask any questions. I'm, I'm watching the chat and, and Dimitri, please interrupt me if anything is um, not clear. Um, so I think technology is awesome and I love tech, but maybe before the tech, I, I think like technology should, should, should solve a problem. So let's maybe talk about what I do and, and the problems I'm trying to solve. So <clears throat> um, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called 15 Rock, and we do a lot of climate analytics. Uh, previous to that, for about 20 years, I worked at uh, various financial institutions. I was a managing director of Manulife John Hancock, uh, TD Securities, Scotia Capital. I worked at different hedge funds and mutual funds and um, always been within the finance space, um, blended between technology and, and investments. And um, one of the problems those fields have, which I'm sure is not unique to them, is they need to process a lot of information very, very quickly. And the challenge is, at least the, that I'm finding, is that you can see someone's speech and they're giving you the conclusions. And that's kind of how these CEOs and executives are trained. But the, the benefit of a good analyst or a good investor or a good researcher is to go behind what the words are. What is the intention? What are they, what are they thinking? And like with Info Notice, the beauty of this tool is that you can actually start to make connections and dig in deeper, which like it is possible without the tool, but it is a very difficult process. It, it is, um, I don't know if you ever watched like any YouTube reviews of like a movie or a book and the author, like, or sorry, the, the reviewer talks about the high level, then they dig into these obscure facts and they connect it to something else. Um, that This tool allows you to have that level of expertise without actually um, maybe putting all that work and life effort into like a movie or a single book. Um, so what I'm gonna show you, uh, no, sorry. <clears throat> It applies, like I'll show you a kind of a little more financial centric version, but this actually applies to anything. Like I've, um, I use the same workflow that I'm using on uh, music lyrics, on uh, books. Um, if you guys have a chance, try this on the book Sapien or any other book that has maybe many ideas in it. Um, Romeo and Juliet done it a lot too. <laughs> um, you can actually really understand things very differently and it shows you the quality of thought that I think is um, use, since using this tool has given me like a new appreciation for some people. Some folks, um, their thinking is, is very shallow. Um, and I think, I mean, maybe not all, but for some people, um, but then others, like, for example, um, in my view, at least Shakespeare, his thinking was very, very dense. Like you can see through multiple layers, he's building upon the idea and you can, it's a very interesting way of thinking. And I've done this on like, um, Plato and like, once you figure out how to use this tool, you'll get obsessed with it. So, um, the one negative of this tool is that it kills your social life because you you don't want to go outside, you just want to work on it all day. Um, and, and I think uh, maybe my last continuous point on that is that like when I see Dimitri in a lot of his examples, um, he's using this also on himself, which is really cool. So I'll show you how to analyze other people, which I think is more interesting for me. But Dimitri, he's using this to like, chat and share his own ideas. And then you can also refine your own thinking, which I think is is also incredibly cool and and it's a way to improve yourself. It's a way of even um, maybe looking at other people's thinking, figuring out their depth of their thoughts, applying it to your own thinking and seeing your gaps and trying to improve. So um, I think this is such a great tool for understanding yourself, understanding the world um, and the growing. So I'm not gonna go on more rant, but I can talk about graphs forever. I, I love this tool. I love graphs. This is, this is really something I really find interesting, but I'll start with the problem that, I, that I'm trying to solve then specifically. So I want to understand like people, I want to understand what people are saying. I don't have the time to go through everyone's ideas, like dig in, highlight everything, and then go to another level and reflect on it and, and ponder. I want a quick way of getting like information from, from, from people and then kind of uh, digging into um, to finding interesting ideas. This helps me understand quickly what people are thinking, but it also helps me understand where maybe the basis that they used to get there, as well as maybe where they're going, which is obviously in a world where we want to try to predict the future, this is very helpful. So I will set up uh, like a use case. This is um, not exactly what I, like like a specific, like it's not a real one, but it's, it's, it's a, I think it represents what's possible the tool. So there's a company called BlackRock. They are an investor. 
And what they do is they have um, a few different things. So they, they publish a lot of information. And sometimes it's interesting to know what they're doing because they're such a big player in the market. Knowing what like the, the big people are doing is, is very interesting. Um, and also like maybe going into specific key members and understanding how they're thinking is also very interesting. And um, this thinking applies to any, any organization. So it doesn't just have to be BlackRock. Like we've done it with US government. You can take the speeches of the president and then take other groups and, and, and see how they perform relative. Um, there, there's many different options. So I'll, I'll show that to you in a second. So the, the use case I'll show you first is, is let's go through one single person and then let's also try to see how we can then take that analysis and scale it up. Um, so I will start sharing my screen. Oh, um, Dimitri, can you enable uh, screen sharing? Oh, you're mute. I think I should make you the host. So okay. just a second. That's a lot of pressure, but I, I'll try my best. <laughs> and, and throughout the process, please, like, um, again, this is, I haven't done a graph presentation in a long time. So if you have any questions or anything, please, um, please just, just message in the Q&A. Um, OK, so let me try this. OK. Um, oops. Are you seeing my screen right now? Yes. OK, great. So. Very simplistically, I, I, I will show you. So this is um, the chairman of uh, BlackRock. He writes a letter every uh, every year, and it is a really cool letter. It's very influential in the financial markets. Um, but there's two problems. One, it's fairly long, not that long, but like it's not like a novel or anything. But it is long. But it's also dense with a lot of ideas. I don't know if I have the time to exactly go through all that. So what I do is. Um, very simplistically, um, I already did this on my side, but I, I can just do it. Should show you guys how easy it is. So this is not like pre-processed. This is literally just like I'm doing it in front of you guys. So um, I open it for notice. I'll go to apps. I just click on. Um, I can just do write text. I think analyze file also works. I just say analyze text, and then I just click here and I paste the text from that thing. That's all you do. And as soon as you save it, you give it a second. And this is not being like fast forwarded or anything. This is actually real time. Um, you get this like amazingly cool graph. And to be totally honest, I'm not super interested in the graph. I'll, I'll make my screen bigger. Um, although it looks really cool, I'm actually more interested. Sorry, there's a few, um, this uh, Zoom thing is in the way. I'm more interested in this area here. So what I tend to do is I tend to say, show AI categories. What it does is it gives me like a real world kind of like information on, on, on what he's saying. And then I hit the plus to see all of the other, like the, the, the larger topics. So here I can see there's 10 high level topics that he talked about. And again, I have not read that document right now. I'm just, this is just single-handedly just figuring out the, the themes. And what I can do is I can start to explore things here. So what I, what I tend to do is I click on things that I might find interesting. So maybe global transition, which is related to energy. I can see how it's sort of connected here. I can click on maybe investment risk. And what it's really doing, which I think is phenomenally cool, sorry, I'm like moving these uh, Zoom windows, is on this side at the uh, left-hand side here for me, um, it shows that it shows the, um, the text from where I pasted in a way that's highlighting both those topics. And I think that is like, that it's worth its weight in gold. So like, let's stop for a second. Just think about what it actually just did. It took the ideas this person had, broke them down. And the other thing is, and maybe Dimitri, you don't have to share your secret sauce, but it's very interesting in that these are not always just the sentences or paragraphs. These are connected in different ways. So it's finding like ideas, putting it together, showing you the high level topics. And then when you're selecting those topics, it's showing you where those intersect, which like that's super interesting. Because if you want to say, okay, like I want to understand the global energy transition and the investment risk around it. I select these two and all of a sudden now I'm starting to get where these ideas are, are connecting. And like I, I have gone through some of these, these reports and, and it's, it's incredibly accurate. In fact, we've shown this to some uh, clients who've, saw, who've said like this tool has been able to um, figure things out that they've had research teams dedicated to for multiple years. So, like, I don't think there's a human behind this, but just the power of natural language and network analysis can give you some amazing insights. 
Um, and one thing we do sometimes is we, personally at least, I do this to like, before I'm about to talk to someone, I'll try to figure out what they're interested in. And then I'll find the areas that they're specifically interested in. And I'll personally go and research those. And, and there's another tool here in the, in the middle where I think you can create AI generated questions and things like that. And I've seen Dimitri use that in plenty of videos. Um, personally, I, I don't use it, but it's more just because between these two features here, this is really all I need. And, and it's it's more than enough. It, it, but when I do play around with this, it does give me interesting questions. And if this is your own writing, like as I've seen Dimitri do, you can ask a question to find a gap in your thinking, or you can just click on gaps here and you can see what the gaps are. And, and in fact, the this is actually true, is I, I know a bit about BlackRock, uh, the energy transition and having like market access is, is, a, is a gap for them. So it's, or it's a gap in their thinking. So, um, Right, yes. So, okay. Yeah. So, so this would give that insight. It, it would be very helpful to um, to see where the gaps are. If you so say you want to talk to um, BlackRock, um, I would personally like reach out and assess. Like, say you have a way of assessing that gap, and most likely they're aware of that. And 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 that is a very actionable insight that you just got within like I don't know five minutes of using this tool. Um, also, what I tend to do is I'll go in and I'll like try to dig in deeper. So I might say, okay, like um, you just click on the influential nodes or any node for that matter. Um, I might say, okay, I'll, I'll click on, I'll click on like say, I don't know, BlackRock. Um, I don't care about the word term, financial, and it will show up here at the top. Uh, sorry, I need to like keep this zoom thing a lot. And these are the, it's like highlighting where those words occur. And if I hide them, what it will do is it will reconfigure the whole graph again. And it will then figure out what those priorities become or those topics become. And then I can do the exact same thing. And I can start to figure out where those items start intersecting. So that to me is like incredibly helpful. There's other things where it um, you can go through sentiment analysis uh, to find out how positive or negative they are on a subject. But that's also very helpful to see if someone is um, positive or negative on a specific subject. Um, and there's this trends where you can see how like a subject evolves, like how like it, it, it's being mentioned more over time. Um, but generally for my workflow, it's it's really understanding the topics and then going into the influential area and just going in further. So what these are doing from a graph perspective is these are the influential nodes that are connecting other communities. And if you click on this reveal underlying ideas, it takes these and it hides them. And what that's doing is once it removes them and it um, reconfigures the network, it's showing you the new connections. and. Theoretically, if the ideas are very solid and they're built upon each other, there shouldn't be so much movement. But if the ideas are a bit volatile, you'll see a lot of movement in, in ideas. Um, and, and, and you can see actually, as, there, as, as we did that for one layer, you can see some of the themes are still there. So this is fairly well thought out, uh, but this is one of the biggest investment firms in the world. And I'm sure he's had many, many people work on this, but you can start to keep digging deeper to find certain insights. And maybe at like, I don't know, layer five or something, you say like, okay, you know what? I wanna connect um, like, I don't know, subject A and subject five together. Then you can follow that same workflow and you can start to, um, I don't know, like ETF growth and transition, energy transition. You can start to see on the, on the left-hand side here where those items start to um, intersect again. So you can start to get very, very interesting ideas um, from topics that perhaps weren't even intended for that idea, but they, there's some idea behind it that, that, that's useful. Um, so that's really, 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 really helpful. Um, there's other features that Dimitri has made that I think are, are phenomenal where you can summarize different statements, you can create an outline. So if you wanna like research something and then like kind of slice and dice to the subject, like the subject until where you like it, you can then create an outline and write a blog post about it or, or write a, like a message. Um, there's a ton of features around it. And I think if you figure out something that it's not there, Dimitri will probably add it in like an hour. I feel like before I hit send on an email, he's already he's already delivered the feature that I was thinking of. Um, so it's super helpful. Um, I won't go through all the other items here because personally, I don't use them as much. Like they're very cool. Like for some things I might go in and try to figure out, you know, the concentration of ideas and uh, like, like how focused an idea is or um, how much like it can be influenced other ideas. But um, really this main screen is, is, is just enough. And I think if you're any kind of researcher, this should be like very, very fast to get your information. Um, 
I'll show you another one in a second, but maybe if it's all right, maybe I can pause and answer any questions related to this. Yeah, actually, Tim was asking um, if you could give an example of an insight uh, gleaned from this analysis that might not be quickly available to human researchers. Okay. That's one of the um, questions. Yeah, uh, so this is something me and Dimitri talked about. Um, so yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, so the first time I used this tool, I did it on a government official that I was talking to. And um, I basically said, hey, I studied your speeches. I studied your like boss's speeches. I studied um, things on your, um, your website. And um, this is what I think you're doing. And I had like, um, they had some like, so I don't wanna like disclose who it is. So I'm gonna be a little vague, but I had like information on like some of the ideas and their priorities. Think of like, I don't know, energy transition. And then they started to mention also like Asia very heavily and Korea. And then I started to say like, okay, like from what you're saying, I think you're looking at doing like energy kind of uh, collaboration in Korea. And um, that person got actually really upset with us <laughs> because they thought we had like some insider knowledge on them. And they didn't realize that when we connected like multiple documents of theirs, um, we were able to get this insight. So actually, I, that's a good question. Maybe I can show you how to do that. So um, <clears throat> in this example, I just had copied and pasted one document in front of you. But what you can do is you can click on this little button on the side here on the bottom left, and you can click on add. And here you can actually copy and paste another document in. And as you do that, the ideas start to like, like it just merges them together and reconstructs the graph using like that collective, like those multiple documents. So what you can do is you can take, you curate the documents that you think are most relevant to your subject, to your problem, put them in, and you can get insights that sometimes maybe people want to keep a little hidden. So that's definitely a personal example. And then from then on, we, we, we stopped mentioning um, how we get the insights we do. We just mentioned that we have the insights. I hope that answers your question. Um, is there any other question? Yeah, we actually have three more. Okay. Um, so one is coming from George, uh, who's asking where exactly do the structural gap insights come from? Maybe you said it was just too fast for me, he's saying. Sure. Um, so I don't know the, the, I can tell you what I believe it is, but probably Dimitri, you're better at answering this. But I, I believe these are the gaps within the network. So I think you're doing some community detection. It's finding communities of ideas. And then you're figuring out, I believe, the Communities at the most furthest apart. I think. I don't know. That's my guess. I don't know, Dimitri. Do you, yeah. Do you know that? yeah, yeah. It's a pretty good summary of how it works. Actually, I always recommend people to think of the, the analogy to social networks because if you think of a text uh, as a social network where the concepts are the people, uh, then uh, once you map how those people slash words tend to hang out together in which groups then you have a representation like we have on the graph where the colors represent the groups of words that li like to hang out together, basically. And the structural gap are the groups of words which don't really hang out together a lot. And uh, it's a very simple concept actually that comes from social sciences. There is a research paper on structural holes uh, where they say that when you find those groups in a social network and you position yourself or you find somebody who is positioned strategically between them to connect the groups that are in the same context, but are not really well connected, then this person will be an important broker. And most likely this interaction that this person proposes uh, will lead to, to innovative ideas. So here it's the same principle. We identify communities, just like Gautam said, and uh, we find the ones that are not so well connected or furthest apart. You actually can reiterate it and look at the different ones um, and then uh, we show that, okay, those two topics, they exist in the same context, but they're not really well connected. So uh, then you can think yourself just by looking at the graph, how you, how you could connect them better. And I always recommend to do that just by looking at the graph to think of the associations or ideas that come up, or you can use the AI buttons below, which will do this job for you and generate interesting research questions or even proposals, which would link those ideas. So yeah, this is exactly how it works. And yeah, uh, usually, yeah. So if I would just add to that is that mm -hmm. like, it's, I've seen Dimitri use this all the time on himself, which is very brave and very cool. Um, but I think the other insight is like, by finding the gaps between um, ideas, you can start to your topics, you can start to 
really add value in the world. I mean, these are real problems that you're uncovering. Um, and, you know, like maybe you have to double check, make sure you add more sources to make sure that the person or the company you're talking to um, doesn't like maybe they, maybe that gap is only relevant in the document that you reflected on. But if you have other documents, it may not be there. But if you're confident on the, the documents you use and you see a gap, then like that's a problem that you can actually help solve. And this can create business ideas. It can help position your product. It can like, like if there's a gap in my thinking and you reach out to me and explain to me how you can fix it, I'm very, very interested. Yeah. Also, uh, it's just a place, uh, like I have a personal experience that when I connect those ideas together, this is where the new Eureka moments come in because you always think, ah, oh, actually these two things, they could be connected in a very interesting way. And you always come up with some interesting ideas that challenge your thinking and fill in these uh, gaps in your own thoughts. Yeah. Then, then we have another, like another question from Halid Alameri, who is asking, um, is it possible to touch about, I think he means, is it possible to talk about how to get more info from an Amazon product as a competitor perspective? This, this I can do in the second part of the presentation where I demonstrate some of the workflow. So I'll just note that and uh, I'll show how you can use customer reviews um, in the same way and analyze them in the same way um, and how you can study competition like that. Um, it's actually like a very sim similar workflow because you import customer reviews through the Infranodus uh, Amazon app or you can just copy and paste uh, all the data you have or upload a CSV file and then you follow the same procedure as gotten shown. You know that you just look at the main topics, look at the gaps, see what they're missing, what the customers are talking about that is not connected in an interesting way. And then if you come up with a product or a service which would connect uh, those ideas, uh, then you could offer something interesting. And when you combine it with sentiment analysis, you can also see uh, all the structures in the negative or in the positive uh, context. So you can see what are the things that the customers are talking about when they talk about uh, this product in a negative way. So then you know the weak sides of the competitor. And then you switch in the sentiment analysis tab to the positive comments, and then you see what the customers like about that product. And then it gives you a better idea of how you could uh, target your uh, message to customers. So yeah, I, I hope... Mm -hmm. Actually, sorry, I'd also add yeah. to that. Sorry, I feel like yeah. I, I'm, sure. I'm yeah, please, you. please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there's so many uh, useful, like the tool is so flexible that you could literally do anything you want. And it's like, it's it's amazing. Um, one of the things I, I also do sometimes is I might connect different like topics and I then export, there's a, uh, like a download button here. And I download the key words, like the, the phrase, like the, 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 the text that's specifically relevant to the topic. But I think also what Dimitri is saying is that you could do that on the negative, download it. And then what I do is I just create a new graph and I upload that into a new graph. So now you have a graph that's only based on the topics that you want, doesn't have any other connecting node or any connecting topics. And then you can start digging into that deeper as well. So I think most people in data world know that, you know, a lot of it is like you, you have to clean your data and you have to make sure, you know, you're, you're using the right data. But this is also a good way to filter the topics that you really want to um, explore separately. Yeah, actually, it gives me like it reminds me of the feature that we want to build in for a long time already, just to enable this automatically because it should work like this with just a click of a button. So thank you for that. But it's not, I mean, I do this often, and it's like I think everything in this tool is like less than like thirty seconds or something. Yeah, it's so true. It's, it's quite like, fast. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, exactly. it's not that long. Yeah. <laughs> then. Madeline uh, Sora Pure is asking, uh, do you ever use the filter to just show essential statements or serendipitous statements and how are serendipitous statements identified? So I think she's referring to the filter at the top left, just above the statement panel. So she, she was asking you if you ever use it or not. Oh, um, no, I didn't even know this was here. Sorry, no, That's I don't. Great. <laughs> uh, I, see, I just learned something new, thank you. Yeah, no, nice. I usually just do show all after filtering the topics. And then I just download, export it. Right. right. Yeah. And if you another want... cool thing you can do is, um, we, we, we've talked about this, is you can export it. And it actually exports um, one of the, the type of exports, I think. Um, yeah, visual statements tagged. Um, if you do it to uh, uh, Markdown, what it actually does is it, it, it gives you this text. And you can actually 
paste that in like chat GPT or some other tool. And you can ask it like questions based on like, like I might say, okay, based on the text, uh, the, the tags and the, the topics, um, please, I don't know, like, like, like tell me, write a poem or something. I don't know. Like it, it can, it can actually interact and it gives you some really, really interesting information too. So, um, he has a, a chat tool here as well, or a GPT-3, but you can interact with it in other tools too. But that's the other beauties. I feel like he doesn't lock you into um, their system where it could be part of your other workflow and, and become your, your process. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, and Madeline, I, I can also show it after how I use it myself if you're interested. So we will get to it um, after this first part. So then, then we have another question from Mike. Like actually got them. I've never seen so many interesting questions during a <laughs> webinar. So it's a compliment for you, I think. Oh, that... maybe I create many questions because I'm causing confusion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So make make Brown is asking, can you use it for another languages beside English too? Uh, yes, it works with other languages like uh, French, German, Russian are supported fully. And then you have uh, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, Japanese, Chinese, uh, Norwegian. Swedish, Italian, uh, which you can use uh, also, but the stemming of the words, uh, it cuts off the endings, so it doesn't look so nice, but you can still do the analysis. And even if you uh, want to use another language uh, which is not supported, there is a support uh, article on how you can do that. You just need to switch to use no limitizer, upload your own stop words, uh, and then run analysis. And worst case scenario, you can always use uh, some external translation tool to actually translate everything in English, then, then run analysis in English, and then get the insights and translate them back into the language you use. Actually, sorry, to, to add to that too, this is something I did do. I, 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 this is a use case I, I played with is I took um, the US government climate policies and I also took a document I found on the Chinese government policies and I translated them, the, the Chinese to English, and then I combined them together in a graph just by adding it here. And um, it was actually really cool because then you can start to see the combined ideas. So this is another thing I use it for, like I guess conceptually, is like I'll take like two different groups that probably are not connected to each other. And then by combining them on the same graph, it's like I'm leveraging both groups thinking in one. So it's like it's. It's like good. It's very helpful. I, I think well, my first question was like, I think I was combining like Winston Churchill and like Abraham Lincoln to like help me write a speech. So um, I think that was one of my first interactions with Dimitri. Were, were there any strange insights that you got from comparing Chinese and American texts? Uh, some Something that yeah, was, was weird or strange? Us, yeah, it was, it was specific on us. Like, I mean, it's, 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 it's weird. It's a common knowledge, but like, I guess it was not intuitive to me initially, but like, I think the U.S. approach has been more around the funding side, whereas like the Chinese approach was more action towards the manufacturing of like solar panels and, and different energy. And it's like when you combine them, you get this very good holistic map of like how the world can get to um, to maybe like fight climate change. But individually, it's like there, there was gaps. And I think it was actually very interesting when you take maybe people who don't talk, but you can use them to start to fill in structural gaps in each other's thinking. It's actually really, really interesting. I, I, I'm hooked on this tool, by the way. So that's why like, I, this has opened up the whole world to me. So thank you. <laughs> nice, thank you. Yeah, Tom. Um, then Change Magunj is asking, how can Infranodos be used to create a conceptual framework in research? And then Zabmanatse is uh, adding on to the question, in line with this, can the tool find conceptual gaps in sets of research papers? And this question has the most likes of all the questions. So people are interested in this topic. I think that if we have time, I will talk about it later, but I will also note it now. So um, I think it's kind of like a long subject to explain how you could create a conceptual framework in research. Uh, we do have some workflows, which are already somehow conceptual frameworks of research because it's a workflow that allows you to explore information in a certain way. For instance, uh, the procedure that Gautman was actually following uh, was, as you could see, he first got an overview, then he zoomed into the topics of the overview, uh, then he looked at the gaps, then he removed the first layer, the high-level ideas, and got to the deeper level, and then he basically reiterates. And uh, if you zoom out and you look into this framework, 
you're basically alternating between zooming in and zooming out, which is a really great skill in research. And uh, when I built Infernodus, this was one of the intentions to build in this way of thinking that you're, you're constantly shifting scale. So you zoom out, you see all the ideas, and then you can zoom in and look at the specifics. And that you also alternate perspectives because uh, depending on where you enter into the discourse, you will see different things. So this is part of the framework. It's explained in more detail if you go on infernodos.com and you go on the about page, uh, just, just if you click the link about, then it explains a little bit how it works. And then it links to the support article uh, on our support portal, which I'm gonna link in the answer to this question, which explains this method methodology in more detail. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, we're still developing it uh, and hopefully soon we will come up with something a bit more formal. Do you yeah, want to add I mean, something to them? For me, like what I, what I do is like, this is actually really how another huge value is that as I'm exploring the graph, um, I can do it very quickly, but it also like, like you're right, as you said, like depending on different like points of the graph, like depending on, on the information I filtered, I get different insights. I see different parts of like this um, mountain, I guess, of, of knowledge. So what I, my personal workflow is, um, depending on how I feel, it's either pen and paper or I use Notion or a, a notepad. I know there is a notepad feature here. I, I don't personally use it much. Um, I, I probably should start, but I constantly am documenting ideas because the problem is, is like, I may be trying to get a specific or find something like, like go deeper, but on that route, I see so many like beautiful ideas that, um, I always try to make note of them so I can come back to them later. Super helpful. Right. Okay, so then uh, Jean-Charles Quantot is asking, uh, I know this we already had, uh, so I'm going to go back to the unanswered questions. Uh, Halid Alameri is, is asking again about uh, Amazon product reviews. I'm going to answer this later because... Gautam also has to go soon, so I'm just going to try to find questions that relate to his presentation more. Uh, Josh, it's all right. Um, yeah. I, I can. I have another part. I was going to show another way to mm -hmm. use it. Also, um, I can. If you, whenever you're ready, I, I can continue that as well, and then we can go back to questions if that works. Do, do you want me to? Do you want me to show another one more use case? Oh, I think you're on mute. Uh, yeah, yeah. let's do this in the meanwhile, and then I'm going to uh, pose some questions if we have time left, uh, okay. or yeah. just answer them myself. Great. Okay. okay. Yeah, and, and actually now I will stay because I, I do want to know <laughs> these, these answers. These are really good questions. Um, so I'll, um, I'll show you another use case that I use. So I, I think this example I showed is like one um, document, maybe one person's speech. I think it's incredibly helpful in its own. I've kind of showed to one of the questions that you can add more documents. But one thing that when I realized this worked, like on Info Notice, I, I went crazy because it's, it's, it's really cool, is sometimes you want to analyze like documents at scale. So here's my little hack. I, I don't know if this is, I don't think this is officially supported on Info Notice, but this is what I do. Um, I look up other things. So to keep with BlackRock as an example, um, I might look at their Climate Institute, or no, sorry, this is not, this is their uh, Investment Institute. And I'm like, wow, there's a lot of stuff here. There's a lot of different pages. There's a lot of different ideas. Um, I'm lazy. I don't want to like copy and paste like 50 pages and like uh, work on this. So instead what I can do, which is really cool, is I go in and I go into some websites. Um, this is like my hack, but Dimitri, if you want to implement this, go ahead. Um, I look at company sitemaps. And once I get the sitemap as an XML, um, I use like, you can Google any site um, that does this, but there's XML to CSV conversions. So what I do is I convert the XML uh, into CSV. And then just to keep it in my browser, I should, I'll show you. Um, this is um, how it would look. These are all the pages on BlackRock's um, uh, a site map. So like, you know what, sometimes it's very interesting actually to go through, like I might pick a section and say, okay, I want only the biographies or I want only, I don't know, the compliance or something. Like, like you could pick different sections and, and these sites, the way they're organized is they're actually, um, they're organizing it for you by topics almost or some categories. So usually what I do is I filter by the URL 
And for here right now, I, I created a tab called Pages I Want. And it's basically everything under that Insights Institute, just kind of like the research arm. And all I do is I just copy it. Uh, let me do it live right now so it's easier. Um, I just go into apps, or this is like the main screen. And there's a button here called Market Research. I go there. Um, there is something called Websites and URLs. To be honest, I have not actually gone through all these options. So like, I feel like every, like I need to dedicate like one day every week to like go through each one of these. Cause I feel like there's a treasure trove of, of options here, but I go through websites and URLs. And then what I do is, I don't know if I copied it here. Let me, let me copy it. I go in here, delete this. I paste it. I'll give it a name. I don't know. I'm not going to be creative. Pass. BlackRock Institute or something. And then I just save it. And this will take a few seconds. Um, and what it's actually doing, which is amazing, and I, I hope uh, Dimitri wins a Nobel Prize or something for this, how awesome it is. Um, but uh, it's, I don't think they give Nobel Prizes for this, but if they did, um, it's taking those sites, scraping the, the content and making that graph for you. So you don't have to copy and paste across many different sites. So, um, I don't remember how many pages I gave. Um, I gave uh, 40 pages and like, like this is real time. It's actually almost done. And once this loads, like that's how long it took to get 40 pages worth of insights on a company. You can basically take their category, categorized data and put it all together and see exactly the way they think. And, and I won't go through this again, but effectively you do that same approach that we did for uh, that single letter uh, for, that, for, for their founder. Um, and you can start to do the exact same thing. You can start to uh, dig in deeper. And, and personally, from my experience, um, I find the more information there is, the more text, the more, um, I guess, more stable the insights are. Like if, it's, if, it's, if you're taking like one page of someone's speeches or their document, it, it might be a little harder depending on, on how they think. But if you have hundreds of pages and, and, and thousands of, of rows of text, um, it becomes much more stable. Um, and, and you can see it has 7,271 blocks of, of, of statements here. And as you start to click on stuff, you can start to get a lot more examples. And you can see the gaps and, and there's so much cool stuff. So like, you know, like it, it, it's a really treasurable information. And then you start to, where I think initial creativity comes in is if you can take like, I don't know, for example, like BlackRock investing, and combine it with like, I don't know, Google research or something, something totally different and see where the intersections occur. Um, I think it gets very, very cool. So that's the ideas I had, but happy again to, if any questions with my workflow or just happy to, to stop and learn and, and <laughs> see what Dimitri has for the other questions. Uh, I'll stop sharing. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Gautam. Uh, Thank you, my pleasure. I think that you can actually keep sharing if people have any questions oh. about your, your workflow, but let's okay, see. Sure. Uh, what they say. Um, so one, I'll just read the questions that uh, relate more to your presentation. Okay. And then I will answer the other ones uh, later. So maybe that's an interesting one. It's a bit of a philosophical one from Joshua Stamper, who's, who's saying, given that meaning is so context dependent, is there any concern about a distortion of context and the consequent distortion of meaning through this kind of analysis? particularly when you're merging multiple documents. So maybe you can. Ooh, that's, a, <laughs> that's a tough question. Um, so I, I I definitely get that. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I, I'm, even my example earlier was like connecting BlackRock and, and Google or um, Winston Churchill and Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, for sure. There, there, there's, it, it's not um, like, like you could create a meaning when there's no meaning. So, but I think the purpose of this tool um, at least from my view, is not to give me necessarily meaning. It's to show me ideas and how they're connected. And then, and I think I am the one as the user who infers the meaning. Um, I, I, the, yes, I, I'm sure if you use the AI, I'm sure um, the AI would probably try to give you a meaning. Um, but I, like to be honest, I don't use it for that reason. Where I try to infer my own my own meaning from it. So I I think it it, it it's like any tool. It's it's as powerful. Um, or as, like, as, as good and as dangerous as the person using it. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, that even 
in fact, what we're seeing right now on the screen is the context that we're analyzing. So, of course, if we just stay within this context, uh, it will be very much biased to the context itself. Uh, and the tool just gives you a possibility to actually unravel all the connections that exist inside, look at the gaps, uh, see what exists uh, in text, uh, how you could connect these different ideas. So, in fact, it is helping you to dig into this context, to explore it from different perspectives and to uh, help you avoid distorting it by just the normal reading that we usually have where we read in a chronological way from the beginning until the end. So it's attempting you to give a, some kind of diagnostics of text. But of course, like Gautam said, it's up to you as an interpreter, just like with any tool, uh, you might get biased uh, onto certain way of reading it. And then of course you will distort uh, what the text was trying to say. But then at the same time, it never really matters what it's trying to say. What matters is how we perceive it also. And the tool is made to allow you to have different entrances into the text. That's why it has uh, so many features and uh, so many different entrance points. Like you can look at the overview, but if you just look at the overview, you will of course distort your, your interpretation by the main idea. So this is why we have the gaps inside, which allows you to kind of dig into the holes in the text, then we have the reveal the non obvious or the underlying ideas button that removes all the popular ideas. So you don't look at them anymore, but you see what's hiding under and that you start looking at the periphery. And in fact, uh, uh, this whole network structure algorithm, which is built in, um, it has like this weird graph. If you got them, could just click on this uh, semantic variability icon at the bottom of the screen. So we show that oh, weird part of Infernodus. Yeah. Oh. I didn't even know we, this existed. So yeah. I... It, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like an esoteric <laughs> part of Infernodus, which actually is just helping you discover uh, how biased you are in your interpretation of the graph. So it's going to be developed further right now. I think it's quite difficult to understand, but if you have time, you can read about it in the help icons uh, that are located with the question mark next to each feature. But basically, this is the framework, which is guiding you through reading this discourse in a way that would uh, allow you to have as many different perspectives as possible and to not get biased by what is visible on the surface, but to rather go into the periphery and explore all the underlying ideas. So yeah, that's uh, now we can close it, I think, because I don't want to <laughs> scare anyone yeah. with this. Uh, sorry, I'll, I'll go. I think I've also uh, mentioned, um, I don't know the video, but um, when I first found this tool, I got like, I was obsessed with learning as much as I can and go through documents and I think Dimitri has a video where he was like going through some ideas and he was like disagreeing with himself, like live on some like video. <laughs> and um, it, it, it's very interesting. So it doesn't necessarily mean you always have to like agree with the connections. And I think when you see something, you can actually start to in, interject like disagreements into your graph. And, um, and and yeah, I think I think I saw him having like a like a Socratic conversation with himself. It was very fascinating to see. So um you're happy you're it's good to look at the other side too and sometimes this is I, I use like chat uh gpt or like other ai tools to say like like highlight some areas here and say what are the counter arguments to this and then get some ideas around that and then maybe put that in the graph and see how the graph changes and you can delete items off the graph too and, and it, it's a really interesting way of exploring your thinking right it also we have this challenge button actually where you can use the ai uh, to actually challenge you in the AI Insight tab. So that's like a, a more recent addition, but it will basically challenge uh, the statements that you find in the text. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It wow. came out with some. I don't need my girlfriend to argue me anymore. I could just use this tool. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So then the next question is uh, from, uh, let's see, something. Diagram. Okay, so this I will skip for now. Um, what scale of Tokyo? Okay, this is a technical question. Um, uh, Ron is asking, thank you for showing use of sitemaps and URLs. Uh, do you also use this tool for RSS feeds? Is that a feature? Yes, it's a feature, it exists, but let's see if Gotham says if he used it or not no i, I proceed i i, I just okay. use it that maps right now but i didn't know actually <laughs> that would actually make it a lot better for you i didn't know that feature exists maybe yeah i'll, you, I'll dig into that 
Yeah, you might even be able to actually add the, the sitemaps into the RSS app and maybe it will visualize it. I'm not sure. So let's not try it now, but uh, <laughs> I will try but we too. might already have the feature that you requested in there. So uh, yeah, let's look into it because uh, yeah, RSS uh, feeds are great because uh, I use it all the time to analyze news and you also have external services that can create RSS feeds from stuff like Telegram channels, for instance, which is really interesting because you cannot usually access them so easily. And uh, yeah, you can just like feed the data through the RSS feeds and then RSS feed graphs, they also have live update features. So you can set it to be updated every day. And then you will always have the picture of the news, for example, or uh, if you're tracking a certain topic, you can use it for that. Yeah, actually, you know, sorry. I feel like every time you answer a question, you give me another use case that I've used. I'm sorry, I use this tool for like everything. Um, there's an option and I don't remember where I found it, but it's in Infranotice where it can take like live audio and create the graph real time. So what we've done in our company is sometimes what we'll do is we'll just, two of us will talk, open our laptop, start recording. And as we're talking to each other, this thing is generating and updating the graph every like few seconds. And uh, we can see as topics are developing, we can see ideas that are validating it. And we're like almost like real time trying to figure out like problems with our own thinking. It's super cool. Yeah, so you can give that a try. It's yeah. definitely an option where I've done it before. Yeah, I, I actually also use it when I ideate, uh, if I'm just talking out loud, or you can also use it just by typing ideas into the editor on the left. And it's, yeah, it's pretty interesting to see how your thought develops, actually. I really like the look of it. I think it was one of the main fascinations, actually, why I made it for notice, just to watch your thought constructing as a network, you know, as you're thinking. I think it's super exciting. And then you can start seeing what you're missing, how you could develop it further and so on. It's like so a now you guys know I'm crazy. I'm not even just using it for notice so much. I'm actually just talking to it as well. So it is um, <laughs> <laughs> my next call might be like a straight jacket or something. As yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, Yates um, is asking, okay, that's like a technical question. Uh, I think we're kind of done with the questions for you, Gautam. Okay. So I can... Uh, Nice like, question. unless you want to add something, um, I can no, switch no. to the host mode. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, I reclaim host. Uh, I don't know if it worked. Am I the host now? now? Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, thank you very much. It was really informative and interesting, this presentation. And it's always great to see how other people use the tool. And you were uh, so precise and concise also. It's really nice. And thank you for answering all the questions and also for, for the time. It's great. Thank you. And uh, yeah, like if anyone else who is joining this webinar now ever wants to join and to showcase their workflow, uh, demonstrate how they use it, uh, please write to me. I would be really interested to host uh, a session with you, just like we are doing today with Gautam. Um, I think now I'm just going to answer some of the questions. And then if we have time, I will demonstrate some other workflows. But I think it was quite a lot of information. So maybe... And in fact, uh, Gautam already showed some of the workflows I wanted to show today. So may maybe we will just uh, push the things that I wanted to show for, for the next webinar. Right now, I'm just going to share my screen so we have a nice picture. And then I'm going to try to answer some of the questions. Okay, so let's see what we have. Uh, Halid is is asking, is it possible to see what was mentioned in the negative Amazon product reviews versus what was not mentioned in the positive product review? So this kind of comparison, you would have to do it manually. But basically, uh, just to show you an example, uh, all you need to, to do is to go to market research and then you choose Amazon reviews. Then you choose the product. I think the default one here is a book called Satin Island, which is really nice, highly recommended. Uh, you can choose slightly more reviews. By the way, this doesn't always work so well because basically Amazon is not providing access to this data through an API. So we're using third-party provider and I think they're just scraping results from them and taking all the legal risks associated with that. Uh, so sometimes it takes uh, a time to load, but basically after you load uh, this information, the customer reviews. And by the way, you could also use your own um, CSV table or spreadsheet or just copy and paste stuff like Gautam did. Then you would be able to get them into the system. 
And then uh, you have the sentiment analysis tab, which I'm going to show you if this loads uh, that you can use to filter reviews by the type uh, negative positive. So here we have the reviews for the book. As you can see, general overview with all the topics. Here we show categories generated by GPT-3. So we see that uh, there is something about corporate culture in this book, data, story weaving. So that means that people talk a lot about how the narrative unfolds in the book. So they're quite advanced readers. And then if we go to sentiment analysis, we have uh, positive, negative, neutral. And what I always recommend to use, but this takes much longer, is to use the AI model. Because this model, which we have as a standard model, it's actually uh, just detecting uh, the word, and then it uses an algorithm. It's not a machine learning algorithm. If you want to be really precise, then you can use AI model. So that will generate more precise results. Or you can also go here and filter by positive reviews and negative reviews. And here you're just using the score of the review itself from Amazon, right? So you have all these different ways. If you don't have the tags, then you use the tools here. Uh, if you do have the tags, like we have in the case of Amazon, because we have the score of a review, I think positive are four and five stars and negative are one to three stars. So now we're looking at the positive reviews and we see that it's talking about corporate anthropology. So they're talking about the topic of the book itself, uh, postmodern novel. So we see that they're talking a lot about the narrative structure, how it's made. So we know that the readership of this book is really interested in, in how the book is actually written. And then they also like the author, Tom McCarthy, a lot. And also that's the topic of the book. It's, it's about obsession with something. So it's a pretty good account of like what people like in this book. Then if we click on negative reviews, I don't think it has too many. Oh, no, it has actually 30%. So as you can see, we can notice really quickly that people don't like uh, how the plot evolves. They also don't like the author. So they think that his fiction is a subpar. Uh, reading experience, maybe they were, they, 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 they were bored. And by the way, if we want to see what they were talking about, then we can just click on those notes. Uh, hide categories so they don't close the data and then we can see in which context it, it it was used so we see that you're reading this novel and in the reading you're looking for clues to what it's about uh let's see if it's a it was marked by amazon as a negative but probably the person didn't like the reading experience let's see if there is any other uh experience fiction so here they just compare uh, this book to all fiction and they say it's dull narrative. So they just didn't like how it evolved. So as you can see, then we can start digging deeper and see that, okay, some people didn't like the, the reading experience and they didn't like how the plot was made. Um, and then you compare it with the positive reviews manually. And like this, you can see, you know, uh, what the difference is between positive aspects and negative aspects. If, if you had another product, uh, then like, let's say if it was a shampoo, you would maybe see that in the positive reviews, uh, they're talking a lot about the smell and in the negative reviews, they're talking about packaging. So you know the weak and the strong sides of your competitor. So this is how you, this is how you would apply it to uh, marketing research. I hope that answers your question. I'll skip to the next one. Um, I'm interested, uh, Soran is saying, I'm interested in your appreciation of the ML language model. And if you feel supervised training, it would be helpful to guide current and future session analytics. Uh, well, yes, this is a very good question. Um, we're actually not gathering so much data on, uh, on, uh, on how people use the tool to also avoid recording information that would be private, but definitely there is some statistics that shows us that some features or some ways of reading uh, are more useful than others. So uh, definitely it's something uh, in the work to kind of see how we could uh, use uh, the patterns that people go through when they use the tool to read through the text using the graph to then provide some interesting interpretations. At the same time, uh, I think also, uh, you know, just like you say, adding in some more machine learning models to this process would be really interesting. So it's something to 
develop further. Um, and yes, definitely, it's an interesting topic and uh, we should explore it further. If you have any ideas or any feature requests or you, th you, you, you think you know which direction it could go, please let us know because it would be really interesting to have this discussion and maybe we can implement some of the features that will be interesting for you, Ron. Uh, Gautam just wrote that he had to go to another meeting uh, and he thanks everyone for attending and sends us his thanks for inviting him. So that's why he left. Uh, he's a piece of person. Uh, then Paul Henrik Joachim is asking, uh, I work often with city development plans. These plans are text plus uh, visual plans. So my question is, is there any way to analyze diagrams and visualizations that a company of a company to a text? So basically, if you can export uh, this diagram as interconnected data. For example, let's say you have a diagram, very simple. I'm just gonna make a quick draft here using the mind mapping app and show you, like, let's say I say, like I'm writing something about, let's say uh, green tea is good for health. Here I'm using uh, the syntax used uh, in, um, person no, no, knowledge management systems and then I add another one like uh, health is modulated by lifestyle and so on so here I'm building a mind map if you have something similar uh, you could even go as simple as just importing uh, concepts uh, that are listed uh, one after another so for example I can say health uh, comma that's a CSV format uh, thinking then you add this and they will be connected. So basically what, what you need to do is to export your diagram in a text format and you can imagine what format it can be. Usually some of the tools they have CSV, comma separated concept uh, export, uh, which you can then copy and paste or import into Infernotus, just like this. Every relationship is on uh, a separate string and then you visualize it like that. And then you use the advanced graph analysis tools, which you have here to identify which are the most influential topics, uh, what communities they form and so on. Because for instance, if you had a diagram like this, and then uh, you would say that, for example, uh, drugs are uh, bad or something like this, you see you have another community and then you can start to see uh, how those two relate and also think how you could connect them together. So you could say drugs are bad for health here I'm clicking them. So you can even use the tool to then build on your existing diagram uh, in real time. I hope this answers the question. Then uh, Chenge Marungye is asking, how do you come up with research questions from the graph? So uh, the way that I come up with research questions is basically uh, based on, here I'm going to use a, uh, this is Google search results for competitive intelligence. I prepared it for the presentation today. Um, I look at the categories. And then there are different ways how I can come up with research questions. But basically, uh, the main approach is to look at the gap inside. So which two topics could be better connected but are not. You can also reiterate through the ones that you find interesting. So for example, graduate research and executive training here. And then what happens? you highlight them. So you see these are the topics that could be better connected. And then uh, um, you either look at the graph and you think, okay, what is the connection between graduate research, university research and executive training? So some kind of training that is done uh, for executives uh, and in companies. Is there a gap in between those two topics, how I could connect them? Maybe we could create programs that would link research and universities to uh practical programs that exist in the corporate world for instance so i can do this manually this is how i would come up with the questions just by uh, ideating in real time or i can also use ai and in this case what happens is that we send this structural gap to gpt3 with a special prompt and ask it to pose a question that could link those two topics together in an interesting way so here you see it's kind of uh, talking about programs for US executives or just in general executives and how it can be linked to education. So you can either do it yourself or you can use the AI questions. Hope this answered the question. Then Rebecca Owens is asking uh, what scale of documents can the system 
handle and maintain speed. Uh, for instance, how many med AI articles? I think maybe you mean PubMed. Um, basically, there is a limitation because you're working with the graph. So if you import, let's say, one gigabyte of data, it wouldn't work because it's too big and you would have a graph that's too densely interconnected because texts tend to have a, a lot of connections as you're you know, uh, going along the discourse and the narrative. So this is why it would become very dense and almost unreadable. You would just have two or three main ideas and the rest would be hidden and it would be very slow. So we usually recommend uh, to choose a segment of information that you would like to work on. Maybe, uh, let's say, like 10 or 20 articles can work fine. Uh, and then try to analyze this. Like basically anything that would be, let's say, if you're writing a research paper, usually you would have uh, perhaps... Uh, in some cases, you have 20 references or citations. In some cases, you have 60. In some cases, you have 100. I would say it's better to separate them into chunks of 20 or 40. Uh, so if you can do that by category, for instance, that's great. And it also allows you to look into a specific aspect of your research and explore that. And then once you get some insights, what you can actually do is to write down some ideas here in the project notes for each of those uh, batches of articles and then you can just like download it as a text document and then create a new graph from them and then visualize your own interpretation of those ideas and then explore it further so i would rather recommend this workflow hope this answers the question then martin belchev is asking when dealing with code base that involves different libraries languages and many different files and directories is there uh, a way to map which files relate to which files so this you can do by using the personal knowledge management import tool. And if you want to see how the files relate to each other, uh, so here we have uh, knowledge graphs. And then when you import your knowledge graphs, uh, this is the manual import. Okay, we just need to use a Obsidian import or LogSec or Rome Research. So when you import these files, you can actually say, that you vi visualize the names of the files separately from the concepts. Um, or you can just visualize wiki links on them, exclude everything else. Like this, you will be able to see the files themselves as a separate kind of node on the graph. And then you will be able to see how they connect. But to be honest, um, it doesn't work perfectly well yet. Like the UX or the interface is not so fluid with that. So you would need to kind of like dig a little bit deeper to understand how it works. But it works. Uh, so if you understand how it functions, if you watch a couple of tutorials, you will be able to use it well. Um, again, I think there is a limit of about 400 files. So I would, again, segment and choose a, like a category um, or uh, some files that you want to analyze, not all of them at once, and then do this step by step so you don't overload the graph and that you can still work with this information visually. Then an anonymous attendee is asking, uh, I have lots of old Arabic books, which I'm looking to model them for connections. Is there any plans to support more languages fully in the future? Thank you, Dimitri. Uh, yes, we have a plan to support more languages. Uh, so when we add uh, Arabic, we will announce it on our new page. By the way, you can uh, check this. It's on the main site uh, in the about us section in the help you have latest updates page and here it uploads all the latest videos by the way even the webinar that we're watching right now uh the tweets and the newsletter so you can subscribe to the newsletter here i'm gonna post the link in the response to your question and uh yeah be informed uh, when we add new uh, new sources and new languages then uh, Yates Buckley is asking, uh, at its core, am I wrong or the relevance of the node dependent on repeating keywords? So if there is a dominant concept that doesn't share a word, it might not appear as obvious. So it's not exactly frequency. In fact, if you want to learn a little bit more about how it works, there is a section here on the main page of Infernodus and then a reference to the peer-reviewed paper, uh, like a PDF file where you can read exactly how it works. If you want to know but basically it's not exactly frequency but between a centrality which is another measure it's explained here if you click uh, on the question mark 
it explains uh, what this measure is, and then you can read more on our support portal about between essentiality. Uh, if you click here, uh, so then it will explain the approach. But to answer your question, um, if there is a dominant concept that doesn't share a word, I mean, that's a question what you think is a concept, in fact, because depending on the context, uh, some words might be the same or not. So, for example, if I talk about customer and the client, uh, we might think it's the same concept, but in some other con context, uh, we want to separate them. So, this is why we provide a really detailed view. Uh, we're working on uh, adding entity detection. So this will allow you to kind of like extract only much less stuff basically, and not to have such level of granularity. Perhaps then uh, you will have uh, the concepts that are unified. You also have synonyms where you can link some concepts together. So if you think that, let's say customer, if we look at the relations, what it's connected to, uh, you know, here actually they're all different concepts. Perhaps they can be something like compete and competitor. So we can say that we want to link those two and then they become one node. So you could also connect uh, those concepts uh, which you think should be uh, grouped using the graph. Uh, so that's what this, this would be a way for you to make sure uh, that the different concepts uh, that relate to the same thing are accounted for in the text. Hope that that answers the question. Livin Wyland is asking, hi Dimitri, just for Dimitri, is this video available to watch? Uh, the one that Gautam just talked about, I would be really interested to see if it's the case. Uh, I don't know which video you refer to. If you talk about this webinar, it's available on our YouTube channel. It's being streamed live. Um, I don't know what other video it could be. Um, I mean, you can check our YouTube channel and I think you will find the stuff there. If he was referring to the video that I made, definitely it's on there and we have categories so you can find it by choosing which category it's in on our channel main page. Joshua Stamper is asking, uh, can Infernodos be used with other semantical systems that are in text-based music, for, for example? That's a great question. Uh, yes, in fact, you can notate all kinds of stuff. Uh, you just need to translated into text notation. So basically, let's say if I open a new graph and close this, open this field, uh, if I use hashtags, I can write what I want. So for example, let's say I'm using music notes and uh, I'm writing a musical score uh, of a sequence of notes. Yeah, so this is like C second octave, D1, F2, and then it's visualized. We have a, a MIDI connector, which you can turn on in the user settings, and then you can connect a MIDI device and send musical notes into Infernodus and visualize uh, the musical structure as a graph. That's actually pretty amazing. We've done it a lot uh, for fun and for art. And it was really interesting to see how music is being formed live as you're playing it. And uh, yeah, there is a lot of insights that you can also get about the composition using this, because then you basically apply all this graph analytics to music and you can detect uh, some interesting patterns in how music is played and notated. Then uh, Jacopo Coerci is asking, thank you for sharing your experience. Thank you, Jacopo. Uh, then uh, Heinz is saying that he liked the presentation. Thank you very much, Heinz, for your attention. Fantastic Real Worlds Inside is saying, Tim, that's great. Thank you, Tim. Always nice to hear. Uh, thank you, Joachim, for the compliments. And then Joshua is asking again, uh, also I'm curious about the shape of these graphs. They seem to generally take a roundish global globe-like shape. Is there a reason for that? Uh, do they ever take on different shapes? So basically, uh, the algorithm that we use here is called Force Atlas Layout. It was, uh, the implementation was developed uh, by Matthew Giacomi from Gephi. Uh, if you don't know his work, you should check it out. Uh, really interesting guy. And his brother, Alexis Giacomi. So I will just write their names. Giacomi, Alexis Giacomi. It's a power duo of brothers who actually developed a lot of approaches uh, for visualization that we use and for graph analysis in the product that's called Gephi. 
I should write the name of the product as well. I'm gonna do this. It's an open source network analysis tool, uh, big inspiration. And Alexis is the one who actually developed the visualization module that we use Sigma. So uh, this graph that you see, uh, the technology behind this visualization was developed by Alexi. Uh, and uh, basically he uses Force Atlas layout algorithm, which was developed by his brother. And the way that it works is that it pushes the most connected nodes apart from each other. And the nodes or the words that are connected to those most connected hubs are then grouped around those nodes. So this is why you get this kind of view. And it's a very nice intuitive way of representing information because you end up having those clusters of distinct communities, the nodes that tend to belong in the same context. They are also spatially positioned in a way for you to be able to see, like in this case, that they're separate from the rest, right? And they have a different color also. So it's quite an intuitive way of reading graphs. It's uh, used a lot in graph representations. Uh, it's a great algorithm. Uh, the reason for that is just it allows you to quickly see if there are some patterns or groups of nodes that tend to occur together. You also have a circular layout, which you can set up here. Um, I personally don't use it so much. I think it looks pretty, but uh, I like more this one because it's a bit more practical. And also, I like that it kind of represents the structure of thought. In fact, um, here we have abstract layout type, and it's great because you can see uh, how the structure of ideas uh, is made, in fact, without reading what those ideas are. And this is, in fact, how I got into this whole thing. I just was really fascinated by the visual representation. It's like a sculpture of thought, in a way. Um, so yeah, this is why uh, this algorithm is used. Then uh, Anonymous attendee is asking if the recording is made public. Yes, it's on our YouTube channel. Uh, I'm going to type in the link to the channel on YouTube so you can subscribe to it and watch the video. Uh, now it's available in Q&A in the answered questions. If anyone else wants to uh, save it and share it with others, feel free to do so. Uh, Ron is saying, thank you for your answer on machine learning, getting access to OpenAI Whisper. So to ingest audio directly to extract text would be amazing, uh, unless this is already such a facility. Well, you can use other tools that uh, transfer audio into text, and then you could upload it uh, as an audio file and then visualize uh, the content inside. Otter is a really good tool. Uh, so we actually recommend uh, our customers to use Otter for transcriptions because I think they have a free version. You just install it on your phone, upload the file or on your computer. Uh, I'm going to send the name and the answer questions. And then you export the file, like the transcript, and then you upload it to Infranodus in the file upload app, and then you visualize uh, what is being talked about. So yeah, uh, of course, it's nice if if it can be done automatically, and we're working on implementing this as well then george is saying do you know of or can you imagine a use case in which a community is using infernodus for understanding and augmenting its collective intelligence so for now most of the users are really curious individuals uh, but there are some companies uh, that use it on the company uh, level in groups to understand the certain market so i think i've only seen that uh, in the marketing perspective, but the really nice thing that I really like about our clients is that uh, every one of them is working on something really amazing, like uh, not just studying market to, you know, uh, sell something that doesn't seem really meaningful, but for instance, studying climate change, which is a big topic, or understanding, for instance, uh, how how a certain industry can innovate or how it can be more sustainable. So when you're thinking as a as a community in this direction, Infernodus is really useful because you can get a group of analysts uh, onto a topic and then everyone can, you know, use the graphs and uh, generate insights and then share them and use Infernodus to kind of visualize the general picture and discuss uh, the outcomes. And also we work uh, with an organization in France called L'Amazon uh, Forte where they study uh, the discourse of people who live at uh, a certain territory and then they use Infernodus to analyze uh, the interviews that they make with those people and 
to extract the insights to better understand what this community is talking about and what their needs are. And uh, then they they can quickly see that, for example, there is a lack of social life in the towns, uh, but at the same time, they really like the nature and so on. So then, then you can deliver these insights to government officials and help them um, make better decisions and improve the lives of the people in this territory. Then uh, live in Wayland is that is uh, saying that it was very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you for joining us also today. Then uh, Chion Jen is saying thank you for an interesting presentation. Thank you, Jun. Uh, thank you, Chen Jolsta, for your kind words. And then the last question is from Livin uh, Ryland. I was thinking about the video Gotham told you about using the green concepts with yourself. Ah, oh, yeah. Um, I don't remember which video exactly that should be, but um i think it's one of the gpt uh, workflows so if you open uh infranodos youtube channel oops i think my computer is blocked uh just sorry for this little problem i'm gonna try to sort it out in a second okay yeah so uh I think you can see here the YouTube channel. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you will be able to see it here in the GPT and the AI augmented thinking and writing. I think it's somewhere there and more towards the beginning of this. So something like uh, in the first few videos, you know, maybe develop your ideas with text networks, probably this one. So you can look it up there. But I'm going to record a new one, so uh, soon it's going to come. And then Joshua is saying, uh, what was the name of the organization in France that you mentioned? I'm going to write the name in the answered question. So it's called the uh, Maison Fort. I think on their website, they have a presentation about this project. It's still in the works, but they already ran the first iteration. You can contact them or... If you want to get in touch with them, you can also contact me and uh, I will be happy to connect all of you. So um, I think we already are one hour, 20 minutes. It's been uh, quite a long webinar. Thank you very much for joining and staying all this time. Um, I have a lot more to demonstrate, but I think we'll keep this for the next webinars. So as I mentioned, you can subscribe to our newsletter on infranodos.com, but if you're already using infranodos, you will receive uh, an invitation. Um, also, by the way, I wanted to run a quick uh, uh, poll and to ask you to answer the questions to those people who are remaining, because it's been a long time to answer if they're using the built-in GPT AI tool, just to see a little bit, you know, those who stayed the longest in the webinar, I think we have a quarter of people now. But it's going to be a good representation to see if people really use the built-in GPT AI tool. So right now, we're about half-half. And then I have another question, and then we'll be done. Uh, this video, this webinar will be available, is already available on our YouTube channel. So if you want to watch it again, feel free to do so. Um, I will also add some timestamps to it later, so you can quickly jump to the parts where Gotham was uh, explaining his workflows, which I think are really useful. And uh, some of the workflows that I wanted to talk about, I will also uh, let you know uh, when we can run another session with them. So now I'm sharing the results. As you can see, actually, half of the people don't even use the built-in GPT-3 AI, and half of the people do use it. Okay, and then one other question that I wanted to ask is your favorite data source for analysis, just to understand the, what you prefer to analyze using Infranodos. Uh, once again, feel free to uh, write to me uh, if you have any questions to our support portal. We'll be really happy to answer any questions you have. And I'm preparing some really easy workflow demonstrations, which I will upload to our YouTube channel and also add new support articles, uh, where which, which you, you would be able to basically use to run 
uh, analysis and to understand how this whole approach and methodology and the framework that we have implemented in Infranodos works better. I know that sometimes tool, uh, this tool takes a little bit of time to learn, but uh, you know, if you just focus on uh, your intention and don't look at the other features uh, that might not be so relevant to the workflow, it can be really easy to run analysis. And uh, I will post some of the workflows like this so you can really understand which, which parts of the interface you can use to get specific insights. Um, now I will share the results of the poll as well. So as you can see, most people use Infranodos to analyze PDFs and their own ideas. Most of the people who stayed in, until the end of the webinar. And then uh, CSVs uh, also, tables, uh, Google Scholar, scientific publications as well, books, great. So um, yes, let's, I'm sharing the results now. Thank you very much for joining and for taking the time to be with us at this webinar. Thank you again to Beltram for sharing his workflow. And uh, yes, let's stay in touch and uh, talk soon and see each other next time. Thank you very much and goodbye.